Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three adventures that are all technically work in progress. Now, they're all in various stages of completion. Some of them are real close, a couple of them are real close. One of them does need a bit of work. But I wanted to cover them anyway. These are pay what you want or free. Um, and I wanted to cover them because these are great adventures. As they are right now, they are great. And I think with a little bit more work, once they're totally finished, they'll be awesome. Uh, a little bit of correction here and there and all that stuff. So what these need is attention and these need playtesting. Now, again, I have no association with these. I just found them and I think they're really cool. Especially a couple of them that I think really, really, I hope that they get finished because this is really, really cool stuff. Now, as is, they're still totally playable. I think you could play all of these and have a great time with all of them. But one of them in particular does need a bit of work and uh, it would require a bit more... If you were just going to run it now, it would require a bit more work on your end. But the other two don't need all that much work. Just a little polish here and there. A map, in one case, needs to be added in, but you could do that yourself. So the three that I'm going to be going through are A Sword of the Forest, Bound for the Bogwood, and Palace of the Silver Princess Remastered, or it's sort of a, a master edition for Cairn. So it's not the original, obviously, which was, uh, you know, uh, I think it's B3, uh, the old adventure. Um, this is an adaptation of Palace of the Silver Princess. This is the one that needs the most work. It's the one that's the most in progress, and you can definitely tell. But what's here so far is really cool. So I'm going to be going through again, as I said, all of these. Um, and uh, I'll be giving you guys uh, just some thoughts on them and why I thought these were awesome. So the first two, Sword of the Forest and Bound for the Bogwood, were developed for the A Town, a Forest, and a Dungeon Game Jam last summer. I've drawn from it before for a few of the adventures that I've done. I love it because it's super simple, but it's also totally iconic, right? You, for this game jam, a bunch of designers design, designed a town, a forest, and a dungeon. And that's really all you need for an adventure, right? And so it's really self-contained, awesome little regions for each of these two adventures. I think these are two of the best from that jam, at least in my opinion. Now, all three of these are designed for the Cairn system. I've been really happy with the Cairn adventures I've been looking through recently. But Cairn is so simple, so easy to adapt to any OSR game that it shouldn't be a problem. So I'm going to go through them and, uh, yeah, just give you guys, you know, what, uh, what my thoughts are and why I think these are really cool. So the first of them, A Sword of the Forest, has really fun art throughout, and it has a really whimsical tone that I love. I think this would be easy to put into almost any kind of game, especially a Dolmenwood game that's kind of been on my mind recently, because the sort of tone is very much in that whimsical, not even... This one's leaning away from the darkness, I think, more into the whimsy, more into the funny side of things, but I really, really like it. And the art is, obviously, it's, you know, it's it's amateur, but I mean that in a very, you know, affectionate way. It's like somebody presenting their own, their own thing, all their own work, and it, I really like that. So this is the map of the Southern Woodlands. Now, one criticism, and this is just because it's work in progress, I'm sure, is that the locations that are presented here are not keyed in any way on this. And then later on, when you get the description of each location, there is no hex indicator. You just have to kind of match up the description with the picture that you're given here and the, the, the relative location of it to other things, which that needs to be changed, obviously, either on the, well, ideally on both the first page, this map page, put a little, um, you know, right underneath each hex, which, which hex that is, right, which location that is. And then on the location page, as you'll see, put the hex number and, and, uh, and, um, letter because right now it's it's kind of vague it's too vague to be useful i mean you can do it you just have to like really match it up and it's not the not the end of the world that's just one thing that needs to be added in as i saw you get an introduction of what's going on here there's this really cool festival it's a really flavorful idea essentially every year there are these flowers that grow and um the play uh, the the townsfolk gather them up burn them and then they hire this wizard who um basically walks through the depths of the forest and scatters the ashes, and that's the, this idea that it keeps them safe from whatever's in the trees. Really interesting idea, and I love how it has some bearing on this deeper thing that's really going on. But obviously, over time, this tradition has grown up and it has no real connection, no real... It, it's not doing what the townsfolk think it's doing, but it is doing something. I love that kind of stuff, right? That sort of the folklore that grows out of these traditions that grow out of realities that 
are real, but it's not exactly what you think it was. It's such a good, it's such good fodder for an adventure, and it's a really good um, adventure because now the wizard who's supposed to do that has vanished, and there's other stuff happening and starting to, to, uh, to uh, you know, spook the the villagers, and so it's it's just a great it's a great setting. Um, you get the town itself of Tallwater, which is. Um, a great little place. And then you get the, the kind of what's going on in the background, what the things are. The Elder Trees, Swords of the Forest, the Wood King, and the Fate of Leftwine. The Swords of the Forest is a really cool idea that from this particular tree, there's this tree that grows what you desire. The fruit of the trees is whatever a world truly desires. And so for fairies, um, it grows lots of weird things. But for humans, it always grows swords because we want power. That's a cool idea. And so these elder trees have been planted in our world, and so they grow swords. And these swords are really powerful and do amazing things if you have them. And one new sword has been born, and everybody wants it. Fairies want it. The wizard wants it. An undead dude want it. And the people of the town have no idea. Uh, then you get the town, a cool little map of the town here. And again, things aren't labeled, but it's fairly easy to decide what's what. Um, and you get a description of the geography, the history of the town. And then the locations. And, you know, there are some things to do here. There are situations in almost in every single place. But they're silly, right? Like, for example, the oven in the mill. The oven is plagued by a local duck who is constantly stealing bread as it sits cooling. The duck is named Horatio and is the pet of Relk, the apprentice apothecary. She refuses to discipline it without hard proof of its crimes. Mabs asks the party to help. Okay, totally fine. <laughs> but it's not going to be terribly exciting. This adventure really feels to me like it's designed for young players. You know, not not necessarily for just little kids, but it does have that sort of idea, that sort of tone, that you're you're dealing with things like you know a basement full of rats, and you have to find the rat charmer if you want to, and he can make you a deputy rat charmer and give you his equipment. You're not going there and squishing rats. You could, but you also have the you know the um, the rat charmer equipment to round them up, and that's probably involves you know playing some instrument stuff. But the stuff that's happening in town are not necessarily. Um, high high adventure high heroism it's really silly local things now you could obviously change that but that's the tone that we're looking at here and everything has a kind of a reason for being in the town you get the people in the town the ones that are uh, of of import what they want what they have and how they they appear in their voice which is nice to have a bit of role playing advice there a whole bunch of characters then you get the description of the festival of a festival of ash and how it progresses you get these leaf jackets of the southern woodlands, which is kind of cool. And then you get D8 festival encounters, things that can happen if you're participating in the festival. And that's really fun. There's a tournament that's going on here, the jousting, there's a melee, the, the lord has a, you know, a thing going on. So it's a fun thing going on in the background. The players can either stay here for it or they can go into the forest and come back at different times during this festival. It's only three days, so that means you know, you're probably they're not going to see a whole lot of it. You could spread it out a bit longer if you wanted it to be more involved where they get to come back and do things in the tournament as well. Um, and then you get the description of the forest. You get geography and history, D6 random encounters with things like acid gnomes and shroomlings and fairy nobles. That's why I thought this is kind of... Um, it's kind of in the realm of Dolmenwood where fairies are... They're, they're not just like little pixies that are doing their own thing like you, know, you often see. They're, they're, they're fae. They have nobles. There's knights, they have a quest that they're doing, and the world that we're on is like closely bounded to the fairy world, but it's not exactly the same thing. They don't just live here. The dreamlands of fairy, for example, are, are something you can enter. And here's where you start to get the descriptions of the locations. Now here's what I mean, right? You just get a picture, which you can match up to the map, but there's no hex signifier. So you do have to just match it up to the map on the first page. The Summer Tower. The tower stands at the foot of a hill, partially hidden by the trees growing around it and out of it. Four stories of whitewashed plaster with a thatched roof. The door is wood and painted bright red. Around it are various runes, eldritch symbols, epictograms, or and pictograms, depicting the golden flowers being burned. And it's sort of left Wine's Tower. It has some things going on here, some things you can find, spell books you can steal if you manage to get inside and take them from him, but you risk being metamorphosized, maybe being changed and transformed if you do because he's got a spell active in his, in his absence. Cottage Hill with uh, the Exiled Philosopher, which is great. <laughs> uh, you have Riddle Bridge with a troll and some sporlings. The Woodsman's Camp and the Champion of the Forest, who is an Ent that's decided he's going to destroy these men, but he's dressed like a knight because he knows that's what humans do, so he puts on armor and attacks people. <laughs> that's really funny. 
You've got the Great Oak, which has these oak acorn elves and acid gnomes. Essentially, acorn elves are little acorns. The sort of like acorns with legs. Um, and they have overthrown their uh, their monarchy. They've kicked out their ruler and they have established a, an anarchy. Um, a pastoral utopia. They are enjoying their lives free from their parasitic aristocrats. Everyone is in bands and playing the new music. Ocarina Freak Jazz. Life is good. <laughs> um, it's so funny. I just think this is amazing. Uh, there's an old songbook in here. The Acid Gnomes are also um, nearby. Uh, they're only two feet high, but to an al acorn elf, they are giants. Um, the prince has hired them uh, because the, the acorn prince is uh, exiled to a distant tree. He's the rightful heir, and he wants to return. And he's got a criminal frog wizard, and uh, he's he's hired acid gnomes, and it's you get the you get the tone right. As I said, it's silly. This is definitely really lighthearted. It's not high um, high fantasy, high adventure. It feels much more like um, over the garden wall or something like that, which I think is actually strangely enough the inspiration of the next book that we're going to read, which is Bound for the Bogwood. But I think it feels like that. It feels like something silly and lighthearted. Maybe there's a little bit of darkness under there somewhere, but it it's it's more it's more, you know, tonally light and funny. And I think that's great. You can have a little funny adventure, especially if you have younger younger players, this would be awesome. But it's also just whimsical and delightful. I love it. The Stone Witch. Um, there's a lady who, a witch who's been turned to stone. Merwig, the forest witch, she tried to petrify the Shambleman, but he has armor that reflects magic, and so it reflected right back on her, and so she's trapped. Um, and she knows a lot about what's going on if you can somehow find a way to free her. Um, in her house, she has a spell, so you have to find her house, which is the Striding Hovel. There are acid gnomes in there, and there is the... Um, well, it's a, it's a house that, uh, it's a striding house. It can sprout legs and move around. Then there's the Winter Tower, which is a different place. And you have to, again, just find the difference between that and the other on the map. But the Winter Tower has um, spell books as well that you can find. There's a bush ent, Leafoot. Uh, he is concerned about Left Wine's appearance, but knows that he went to the tomb that opened in the forest a week ago to check it out. So you can, if you can find your way to the Winter Tower, you can find out where Left Wine is. Then you get the dungeon itself, which is the Tomb of Aldheim. Uh, in the side of the small tree-covered hill, there is an entrance. Three slabs of white stone form a crude archway, and a fourth lies broken as if, as if, so again, it needs a little, little bit of editing, as if pushed outwards from the inside. Around the entrance is a profusion of golden flowers. If the party enters, proceed to level one, room one. So the first level of the dungeon is very straightforward. It's just this, level one, the false horde, uh, again, um, some misspellings here, but that's okay. This is a this is obviously a rough draft. It needs to get uh, one one more uh, one more edit. I think uh, adding a couple things in here and you know correcting some of the gra uh, the spelling. And you have a finished product. So that's what this one is. Is I think the most finished. It's the most easily able to run it right now. And then level two. And level two is a really interesting little dungeon. It's like the body of a thing that you can get down into. Now, it's also, I, it's not linear. You have choice about where you go, but there isn't a lot of connected, you know, rooms. You go from the four, room, you know, room one to room two to room three to room four. You can go to room five. If you go to room five, you can go to six and seven, or you can go to eight. From four, you can go to nine or 10, but it's not like it loops or anything like that. It's just a very simple, um, you know, pretty straightforward dungeon. A lot of people aren't gonna like that, but you could easily add loops if you wanted. Um, you could make your you could you could make it so that you know say like nine connects down to eight um, through some shaft, or you could make six have a door into four. It wouldn't be too hard to add a few choices there. Um, you do have choices, but they're they're more tree branching choices than than loops. Still, it's a cool little dungeon. I like it a lot. And uh, then you can get to the end. And you can figure out what's going on. And then there is the elder tree itself, which is a uh, uh, the sword has been birthed at the top of the elder tree. You have to climb the tree if you want to get to the sword. You also need to cut it off somehow. The Shambleman is halfway up the tree as the party arrives. Depending on the time of day, their the aura may be visible aura. Um, the Shambleman is trying to take the sword. It doesn't. People think that it's trying to take the sword because it wants it for itself. It actually wants it to to um, 
put it to sleep. It's, it's, it wants it to protect it. It's, so it could be a little interesting there. You're fighting it, and it's, you know, it's kind of a misunderstanding. You, the party probably wants it this for the same reason the thing does, although if the party is evil or they just want to, have, um, they want to take the sword for themselves, then, yeah, that would be something that it would try to stop. And then you get the back cover. So I think this is a great little adventure, Sword of the Forest. Now again, it's mostly done. This one I think is the, well, this one and the second one are both pretty much complete. It's work in progress, but only in that it needs to probably be a little play tested and it needs to be edited for, you know, just a few, a few spelling mistakes. And then the, I think the map does need to be modified. Um, and I think those, those hex signifiers need to be put on the, the location pages. That's all that really I see needs to be done to make this a, a, a completely done, awesome adventure. And again, even as is, it's great. I would love to run this, and I think I, I, I would like to for my, uh, for my nephews, for example. I think it'd be great for them. The second adventure is Bound for the Bogwood. This is by Maxim Lowe. This one is really cool. Now, this one, it seems to me, is completely done except for one map. Now, the map is the map of the final dungeon, and so that's kind of a big deal. <laughs> but, the, but it has descriptions of the dungeon, and uh, you can kind of get the sense of the layout from the description. So you could make your own map but it would be really nice to have that. Um, I'm not gonna lie. So I hope that's added at some point. So one of the things that I love about this book is the layout. It is really, really um, clearly laid out. Everything is very, very easy to read. There's bold, that's key information. Underline means there's a company, an accompanying stat block or item description and text in great boxes is flavor text that may be read aloud to your players. I don't usually use read aloud text, but it's really easy to read. Um, Placing it in the setting is also really easy. There's a queendom, but you could just do whatever you want with that. There's nothing very broad that, that, it, that narrows this down into a particular setting. You got the introduction to the background. Um, what's going on? There's a village where people have started to go missing. There are some religious tensions because there's these sort of old folklore religions that are um, related to the swamp of the region, the bog. And then there's sort of a more agrarian, you know, uh, contemporary deity where the... Uh, the you know the clerics just going around and trying to help uh, and what's interesting here is it's not really presented as like good and bad um which you know it's a kind of tired old thing really what it is more is this uh the, the new one actually has had a lot of success recently there was a, a blight it's, it's an basically an agriculture deity and an old um wilderness deity molag and there's also glurm the deity of rotten decay um but the, uh, the Molug is just sort of the god of the swamp, freshwater, wilderness, frog folk worship Molug. And then um, Amagrina, yeah, Amagrina is the deity of agriculture and livestock. And there was a corn blight that the clerics of Amagrina went through and helped cure a few years ago, as it says in the deity. So, so the people kind of favor it now and they're moving towards it. So it's cool that there's actually like, um, it's not just the clerics of these people are bad and evil and trying to do awful things. Like, you know, you just see that so much. Uh, but the idea here is that there's been a mission to go proselytize to the uh, frog folk in the forest and they haven't come back. And so everyone thinks, oh, okay, they must have been murdered by the, uh, by the frog folk. Not exactly what happened. You get the factions here, the villagers and the swamp dwellers, and then you get the history of the region. And it's all laid out super clearly five years ago, three years ago, or a thousand years ago, I guess, once. <laughs> five years ago, three years ago, two years ago, two months ago, six weeks ago, one month ago, two weeks ago. Get it all laid out there, and then four adventure hooks that you might have for this adventure. It's very clear this isn't so much a sandbox in that there's just a bunch of stuff going on and you can investigate. Rather, this is an advent this is an adventure in a region that allows it's an, uh, an adventure in a point crawl, basically. Um, we'll see that in a minute here. Here's the starting village. I really, really like this place. The, the art is really, really evocative. The style there, the thick lines. I love this. Really draws me right in, and I love the little pumpkins in and amongst the trees because. Um, one of the inspirations for this one, as I mentioned before, was over the garden wall. And you definitely see it. Some of the frog folk wear pumpkin masks. And uh, it's so good. It reminds me of, the, well, it's, it's from the, you know, the part of um, over the garden wall where all the skeletons are wearing pumpkin heads at the village. It's great. Um, Bazabag, or Basabag is the starting village. Um, everybody knows each other. Here are the different locations in the village, and you have the missing persons, and the rumors that the villagers might have, um, and the different locations, and who's there. And they all have something generally to say or something to do. There's not 
there's nothing there's not a whole lot of quests here like you know you might it's not a quest hub like you'd find in like world of warcraft or something like that it's not a bunch of stuff to go and do in the swamp you could add that all in like i said this isn't a sandbox so much as a an adventure in a point crawl and this is the starting point so it really there is a goal it's to go and find the the mission what happened to these people who have gone missing and everything kind of relates to that um, but some of it gives you a, you know a bit more information about this thing or that thing it might give you a bit of an advantage here or there if you spend some time in the town for example you can go to the shrine of molag and if you bring it um uh if you pray at the shrine and maybe bring it an offering you can get a blessing and they're actually pretty good you can cast shroud at will at once the next 24 hours without fatigue you can tell safe food from poisonous food intuitive for 24 hours you can communicate simply with small forest animals for 24 hours or no creatures will attack you whilst you sleep in the swamp tonight those are all really good and um you could so it really benefits you to you know explore the village a bit and to find things out either the swamp's edge one of the ideas here is that the entire forest except for this one point where the village is the entire swamp and forest is surrounded by the sleeping mist that you can't really pass through so this is the one point where people go into the into the swamp here's the swamp itself and again the map is really evocative you get the points the idea is you can traverse to any nearby point just takes a, a watch basically right uh, uh, one watch to get there and so you move through the through the swamp towards the northern end um where the mission actually is and as you're going you're finding out more and more and you can have a few little side treks side quests things like that but really it's you're moving north through the swamp trying to find the mission and you're gonna know more or less when you get there like i said it's an adventure it's not a it's not really a hex crawl or a, or a sandbox or something like that you get the different locations and a brief description of each of them which is awesome and again, I love the little side points here that give you a little bit of information just to help clarify things. What actually happened for the Warden? Travel in the Bogwood, Light in the Swamp, Sleeping Mists, and the River of Reverie, which is running through the whole thing. And then a d20 table for random encounters uh, when you roll a 1 on the Cairn Wilderness Events table. And again, you could use your own system if you don't want to use the Cairn game. Some of these are really interesting, though. There's a great white shark, <laughs> which is just running around in here. Um, Folly Pop, a satyr, is playing bagpipes in Ever in Search of New Songs. He's looking for his mount, a unicorn. Now, the unicorn says if the players find the unicorn, they may be able to follow it to a fleeting portal to the land of Fae. That has nothing to do with this adventure, but easily you could put that in um, and, and make that a, uh, a follow-up quest or, or make that something the players are coming to this forest in the first place to find a unicorn because they need to get to Fae or some reason, and all this stuff is happening in the background. Or maybe, you know, whatever you do. That's a kind of a cool little, little tidbit there that you could throw at them. But there's no other information given about the land of Fae or anything about that, just a, a little bit. Um, what's the, the frog folk? Frog folk aren't evil. There are some of them who are um, who are kind of more more intense, <laughs> if you will, and they have been attacking. Uh, they have been attacking the mission, but not all of them are 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 that that sort of uh, zealous. And um, really, the mission was first attacked by uh, a creature in the woods that's been kind of polymorphing them and turning them to stone. There's a there's a hunter that might be able to help you out, Flask, who's in the frog folk village. Fles could tell you what actually happened at first, but she's still really hurt. And maybe, again, it's one of those things where maybe what you need to heal her is something in the swamp players have to go find. Right, so there's like there's stuff you could just add in uh, to make it a little bit more, um, a little bit more intense, but you definitely don't have to. Um, Hedge Witch, the Gnome Hill, the Battle Sites, um, Ikimur, which is the Lizard Folk Village, um, the Great Tree, Mind of Moloch, the Abandoned Village, and then the Sinking Temple. Now, the Sinking Temple is the dungeon. It says, Clearing, see the following page. Map. <laughs> That's the map of the Sinking Temple. You're going to have to do it yourself. Because then you get the description of it exactly as it is, what it is, where it comes from, what happened here, and why the, the, the survivors are here. And you just get the surrounding region, the gardens, the vestibule, the Great Hall, the chamber, the flooded chamber, the sacrificial hall, and the natural cavern. And then you get the appendix. So, as I said, that's missing. But that's the only thing that this adventure is missing, is just that appendix. Once you get through it, you're going to be... You know, once you... Once, sorry, the only thing it's missing is the map, not the appendix. Um, and if you can add in your own map, which the description is clear enough, you could draw your own dungeon without too much difficulty. Uh, then you get the appendix with the spell books. Now, again, in, in uh, Cairn, every spell book has one spell. And so um, you could just use that uh, you could maybe add these into your own game or use the spells from your own game of choice here the glaive of glurm the mask of water breathing the amulet of amagrina 
a stat block, so and there's lots of cool spells there. Uh, the Assassin Vines, Dryads, Elves, Father Magor, Frog Folk, Giant Aquatic Spiders, Chameleons, Crocodiles, Piranhas, Gnomes, Great White Sharks, Guardians, Hedge, all that. Cool stuff. Um, and I think this is really, really, really cool. Yeah, the inspiration is Over the Garden Wall, Avatar The Last Airbender, and Princess Mononoke. I definitely get Over the Garden Wall. I'm not so sure about the others. I haven't really watched Avatar, so I think it might be very much influenced by it. I can't really tell. But, <laughs> but certainly, I get Over the Garden Wall quite a lot from this adventure. So Bound for the Bogwood, excellent. It just needs that one map. And again, you could add it yourself. Wouldn't be too hard to find a cool map online. Dyson Logos, or just draw something really quickly. The rest of the adventure is really cool. I, I, I highly recommend Bound for the Bogwood. Now the last of these, the Palace of the Silver Princess, that ad adapted for Karen, is the one, as I said, that needs the most work. And it, it really does. But the ideas here and the, the, the what they have so far is really, really cool. First of all, the layout is awesome. The, as you're gonna see, the dungeon map is super unique, or at least I find it to be really unique. And it's done in a really cool way. It's really, really abstract and not a lot of, I mean, I guess some people don't like that abstraction, but I think it's interesting and it is, it, it's enough is given so that you can really easily run it. Like it's abstract in a way that would be very easy to run, I think, be, just because of the way that the layout has been given here. Uh, this is a conversion of B3, Palace of the Silver Princess for Karen. We've made a few changes combining the two versions, orange and green. Now, I don't know Palace of the Silver Princess, so I can't say how much has been changed. But what I do know is this. As I was reading through this, I was super confused at times. I was like, wait, who's this? Wait, who's that? Wait, wait, what? And part of that is because things have been edited and changed and then in part of the adventure and not in the other part. So it needs more work, right? It needs to be brought into one complete thing. Part of that is simply because a lot of the introduction is assumed. It, it assumes you know Palace of the Silver Princess. And that's a mistake, because I don't know Palace of the Silver Princess. Um, now, this is what I mean by the map. It's very abstract, but it's actually really cool. <laughs> right? You just have a description of the relative location and links of each of the rooms. It's more of a point crawl than a dungeon. Actually, that's kind of what a dungeon is, right? It's a point crawl. This just makes that very explicit. You're dealing with a point crawl. It's the ground floor and the top floor of the dungeon, and it's all laid out very, very, very clearly. The little dots are secret doors, essentially. Um, and the uh, the other rooms are just all laid out right there. There are three entrances in, and that's that. Now, some people are going to really like this. Some people are really not going to like this. I have to say, this is kind of how I draw my first draft of maps when I'm designing my own dungeons. I usually just do a block and then a number, and then I draw connections between them in, in terms of like lines. I don't try to draw my maps very visually appealing. Part of, part of that is because I'm not an artist. I can't draw anything that's visually appealing, so I try to do it more mathematically. <laughs> but in that sense, this appeals to me because this is, this is kind of how I design my maps, at least again at, at first, when I'm first just starting off with a, with a dungeon and um, trying to get relative position and stuff. And I think it's actually fairly easy to read. You know you're in room one. Well, room one has four ways out. You can go to room two, you can go to room four, if you find the secret door. You can go to room three, and then eventually, as we'll see in the adventure, the doorway to C opens up, and you can go down to C. It's a corridor. And then from that, you can go to five, six, seven, or eight, or to another corridor, or to another corridor, right? So you can pass down. Very straightforward. You have a D6 random encounters on the uh, wilderness table, and then you get a timeline. Now, the timeline here is one of, the, one of my criticisms, is that it just has a bunch of names, and I don't know who they are. Like, who's this Eric of the Hundred Eyes? Now, I know in the... I, I did some background reading, and it turns out that it's a god trapped in a ruby who happens to be in the palace. And you see that if you read through one year ago. But there's, like, no... <laughs> you just have to pick this up as you read through the adventure. And that's not how I prefer to have... Uh, it, it explained, like, you know, I would rather not be confused while I'm trying to read through the dungeon and figure it out. There's just a few spelling mistakes too, but this needs to be, this needs work. The, the, the overview of the adventure, the introduction to the adventure, the introduction to the characters, that all needs, that all needs work. It needs to be clarified. You get rumors, a D12 table of rumors and the map of the region. Really cool. Uh, I really like this map. It's a very interesting style. Uh, some people aren't going to like it. It looks a little odd, but I think it's really cool. 
And I like how you know, the forest uh, hexes are very clear. The, the field hexes are very clear. The mountain hexes are very clear. <laughs> it reminds me of something old school, really old school. And you get a description of each site. Now, one thing that this book doesn't really give you is a reason to go to the different sites. There's no, you'd have to develop all of that yourself. There's no reason to go to Dead Mule, for example. There's no reason to go to, um, you know, Abaddon Woods or Abaddon Woods, however you want to say it. At least as far as I can tell. There's just nothing out there to do. So, again, this needs a little bit of work if you want to make this into a sandbox. But it would be a great place to start. The palace is a dungeon. That's the idea here. And then there are rules for how to run that. So turn rules, action rules, searching rules, resting rules, and conditions. Panic. Um, you could take these and use your system of your, or use your system of choice. Right? You don't have to. Dungeon elements, the light, doors, and the traps of this dungeon. And then encounters in the palace. Um how that works, how the reaction tables works, and the encounter works too. And the beastries in the back if you want to check it out, page 44. Um, palace change of state. Now, as the ritual to free Eric, there's a ritual going on, is um, as it continues, and evidently this land is called Haven, which I didn't know up to this point, um, and there is evidently a monstrous army that is being gathered, but that's also not made clear up to this point. Um, now, that's also referenced at the very end, that the, 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 the army will scatter, but... I didn't know there was an army gathering. <laughs> so there are just things that need to be clarified, things that need to be revised and, cl and cleared up in this adventure. The palace is covered in, yeah, the adventure begins at zero, covered in a red haze, and then there's a burning eye, a ruined land. It is the beginning of final day. The final day, probably. Um, a low rumble, an ominous, continuous hum vibrating through the walls. Now, one thing that's clear about this adventure is that it really is on a timer. Like, it's like a day which is real slow, I mean, you, I mean, real fast, you gotta go through that dungeon. Um, so there's a timer, it's a tight timer, you can't sleep for a night. Um, so keep that in mind if you're gonna run it as is, you might want to expand out the timer a little bit. Now here's what I really, really like about the way this is laid out. First you have the introduction with the main entrances and where they are. You have a brief description of each of them, you have side uh, information that helps clear foreboding ancient mysterious, you have bullet points, bolded, um, italics, really clear to read. And then you go to the entrance and you have the room and where it is in relation to the other rooms on that page and all of them are laid out on the page that you're looking. So 0, 1, 2, and 3, right there, all highlighted on the map on the side. Super clear. Really, really, really good. I love that design. And again, you see it here. 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 are all laid out very briefly and you see them on the page. Now, one thing that some people are going to like, and some people are not going to like, is how terse the descriptions are. Really brief. Six, the storeroom. Shelves filled with grain sacks, great grain sacks. A dozen beer barrels are stacked against the wall. The beer is good. <laughs> That's the whole description of the room. You could, you could do that yourself. Some people are going to be like, well, just say storeroom filled with stuff, and I could come up with that. Some people are going to say, yeah, that's great. If I want to add more, I can. If not, it's a, it's a good place to rest or to, to retreat to or something like that. Maybe it's a good place to get supplies. You can just add it in. But, you know, again, so it's going to be an upside to some people, a downside to some people. I like it, how terse it is. It lets you keep everything on one page, which is way preferable to paragraphs and paragraphs of text. Still, a little bit more flavor, a little bit more vibe would have been good here. But it's an adaptation. Remember, I think there's a, an attempt to remain faithful to the original, but again, or at least to, to compress the original. I don't know. I haven't read the original, so I can't say. Uh, then the section, once you're past the entrance, uh, 9 through 12, are the caverns. You've entered the caverns with barracks, deserted barracks. Um, sunken bath, a pink pedestal, or something like that. Yeah, a pink pedestal, a mosaic room, steam room, tavern, temple. So you've got a cavern temple, excuse me, on the two pages here. Now, eventually, as you're going to see, this continues on. It's great. Monsters are highlighted with that old orange M and bolded in brackets so you know what you're fighting. And then the maps stop. And for the rest of the book, the maps are not present. And it definitely is clear this is where a lot of the work wasn't done. It well, simply wasn't done yet. There are more spelling mistakes in here. There's more... Stuff that isn't clear, Eric is spelled with a C and a K, back and forth. Little things like that, but very clear there was a bit of a rush at this point to just try to put it together and finish it, rather than to really clear it out. Um, uh, I shouldn't say clear it out, really to um, clean it up, 
and, and polish it and make sure it's done. Uh, but it's good. It's still a good adventure. It seems interesting. It has a lot of the old school, like, there's a random doppelganger here who just wants to kill you. <laughs> and there are two women who are going to try to steal from the party after befriending them. Um, and it's like, you okay, <laughs> you, that's an old school thing to do, rather than a much more, um, much more fleshed out, much more interconnected character. Um, I don't necessarily like this adventure for the dungeon itself. I think it's great. It's a big palace, and I always like big palace dungeons that aren't like ruined, you know, crypts underground. I think something other than that is cool, and so I really like this one. And I think that there's a lot here. It'd be fun to explore. There's good treasure in places. But you're going to have to do a bit more work on this one in order to make it really engaging to your players. But if you're interested in a palace adventure with, you know, a lot of really cool areas, I think that's cool. What I like about this book and why I kind of highlighted here and why I really would like it to be finished is because of that, um, that map design. I really, really like that. And I, and I want the rest of the adventure finished that way and maybe revised once, the writing revised, and, you know, then I can add in connections and I can riff off what else is here. <laughs> but just that, I really would like those, those maps finished because that would make this adventure, regardless of what you think about the descriptions of the rooms or all that stuff, it would make it really cool. It would make it really cool. So I... I would you know? I would check this out, give them some feedback, and give them some playtest feedback. Maybe try to use it, um, because I I would like this to be finished. <laughs> and again, I know like anyone could go in and finish up these maps. It's a lot of work to do, and I get that that they wouldn't you know that they probably don't have time to do it all the time. It's not their main project. This is a pay what you want product. It's not um, something they can just put together very very easily. Um, but still, I think it would be cool. All right, well, um, Palace of the Silver Princess, Cairn Edition, Bound for the Bogwood, and A Sword of the Forest. Three work in progress uh, adventures for Cairn, but they're all really, really good. Again, the, the first two, very little work would be required to make them totally, totally, I mean, they're basically done. Uh, and they are Cairn, which means their rules light enough that you could comport these, or you could port these into any, any system of choice. I highly recommend all three of these. Um, hope you guys found this interesting, and I'll see you in another video.